I'll give you all a moment to acknowledge that. <clears throat> so my name is Joel Tooley. I'm a pastor uh, here in Melbourne, Florida, uh, First Church of the Nazarene. I'm an elder in the Church of the Nazarene, but have worked across many denominations in in uh, my growing up years, my parents were evangelists and our family traveled together and we were um, chronic migrant people <laughs> uh, just throughout the U.S. mostly and some in Canada. Years later, I, um, my wife and I served as missionaries on the border of Mexico and the USA and we lived in Costa Rica for far too short of a time and uh, have been engaged in immigration related outreach and ministries here in the U.S. for the past 10 years. And I'm also a consultant now with the Evangelical Immigration Table, which is kind of the connecting piece that's brought us all together today. And um, some of you I've met in person, it's been wonderful to get to know you and hear about the work that you do with our universities and um, preparing people for a really exciting life in the future. And the thing that brings us together today is this conversation about some of the people who are really important in our each of our contexts, uh, dreamers. And we are hearing um, some uh, challenging steps that lie ahead for us. And so I just want to make a, a couple of brief introductions. We have Matthew Sorens, who is uh, with World Relief and also um, with the Evangelical Immigration Table. And he'll be speaking on the issues relating to what we see happening with Congress and the Supreme Court. And then we have Dr. Uh, Gabriel Salguero, who is the uh, director of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition and also a pastor in Orlando, Florida. And then we have uh, Jacob Dunlap, who is representing the CCCU. And um, I, we will forego uh, introductions from the rest of the group here right now. But at the end, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers and some comments. And when we do that, if you would be willing to just give a brief introduction of who you are and who you're representing today, that would be helpful as well. So Matt, I'm going to have you just go ahead and lead our time, our you know the, the background information that we're here to kind of listen to and, and grow from. Yeah, thank you, for, Joel, for the invitation. Um, and it's good to see some familiar faces and it's great to meet those of you whom I've not had the chance to interact with. Um, but so it's got to set things up where we're at legislatively and why we're in this place. So most of you are familiar with the DACA program, that's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It was set up as an executive action, so by the administrative branch of the US government, not the Congress, back in 2012, really in reaction to a failure of Congress to pass legislation known as the DREAM Act, which was a bill that's been introduced, uh, I think, every Congress since 2001, and which I know the, the CCCU has endorsed and supported consistently since 2001, uh, that would allow immigrants who are brought as children and meet certain qualifications to apply for permanent legal status in, in the United States. So the, the Obama administration acknowledged that they didn't unilaterally have the authority to give green cards, to give permanent legal status, but they thought or that they did have the authority to defer action on particular cases, and there's some legal background for that theory, certainly. And they did so in 2012 for basically the category of people who would have qualified for the DREAM Act, individuals who were brought before their 16th birthday, who had no serious criminal issues, and had been present in the United States since at least 2000. Uh, June 15, 2007, so five years before the enactment of, of or the announcement of the DACA program. That program has been in place now for more than a decade. Um, uh, there's about 600,000 people who currently benefit from it, meaning that they have uh, work authorization and lawful presence in the United States renewable on a two-year basis. However, the legality of the DACA program has been challenged um, in court, and it it took until uh, a year ago in the summer in 2021 before a court actually made a ruling on this lawsuit. Uh, Judge Andrew Hainan in Texas ruled that the DACA program had been created illegally. That is to say, his his argument is or his view is that the Obama administration ex exceeded their authority in deferring action for such a large number of people. Uh, that decision, he when Judge Hainan issued that decision, he stayed the effects of dis the decision on current DACA recipients. So anyone on your campuses who currently has DACA, for the moment at least, is still allowed to renew every two years. Um, however, even going back to 2021, he halted the USCIS, the government's immigration service, from processing new DACA applications. So there's at least about 75,000 or more applications that are currently pending new applications from people who believe that they qualify for the DACA rules under the under the 2012 
um, uh, 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 rules who are not able to be approved. And that actually is probably disproportionately likely to have affect the age cohort that are on college campuses today in the 18 to 22 cohort. Uh, because if, for example, I have, uh, uh, there's a freshman at Wheaton College where I went to school uh, who I know who he was too young. You had to be 15, you have to be 15 years old to apply for DACA. He was too young to apply for DACA when the Trump administration tried to shut down the program back in 2017. When a different court ordered that they had to resume applications, he did file. And, you know, eight months or so later, you had a different court saying that there was no more applications for DACA, or at least that until the court decision has reached its conclusion, they can't be approved. So he's got a pending DACA application, and he started his freshman year at a Christian college, and the, his, you know, future is, is on the line with that decision. What uh, most recently, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals heard, uh, made a ruling affirming the lower court's decision, finding that DACA was created illegally. So what we're now likely headed towards is a Supreme Court decision. We don't know yet exactly what the timeline for that will be, um, but it could be in 2023, probably more likely at this point in 2024, uh, but very likely before the next congressional election. And there's uh, some good reason to think that the Supreme Court will rule uh, against the DACA program. The, the good reason there is past precedent on a separate deferred action program that the Obama administration tried to launch after DACA, Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, uh, that the Supreme Court uh, prevented from going into effect. And the legal rationale will be very similar with some new justices on the court now who there's not a lot of reason to think will be more favorable towards uh, the DACA program. So where that's really concerning is it means that the, for the roughly 600,000 individuals right now who benefit from DACA, who in many cases have been renewing it every two years for 10 years now, they will very likely have their work authorization withdrawn, meaning that uh, every single business day for two years, you'll have about a thousand people lose their ability to work lawfully in the United States. That includes probably a number of alumni of Christian colleges, as well as uh, current students potentially. Uh, having your work authorization withdrawn means that most employers are not going to hire you. They're, if they're following the law, they're going to lay you off. And that's obviously really concerning. Sometimes we hear about DACA kids, uh, but of course, these were people who were kids in 2007 or earlier than that when they were brought to the United States. At this point, many the average DACA recipient is in their 20s or 30s. Many of them actually have kids of their own. Um, about a third of DACA recipients have U.S.-born children. So you have economically self-sufficient families who are making ends meet now with you know mortgages and car payments and rent to pay who suddenly are not going to be allowed lawfully to work if the Supreme Court would rule against DACA. So that's why we've been pushing at the, at, at the evangelical immigration table as hard as we possibly can for Congress to act, um, which we have always said would have been you know, preferable to the Obama administration acting in the first place um, to actually have a legislative path to permanent legal status. Uh, the House of Representatives did so last year. They passed a bill called the Dream and Promise Act. That was basically the Dream Act, uh, along with this, um, additional legislation for individuals who've been longtime recipients of something called temporary protected status. Um, it was pretty clear that the Senate was unlikely to take up that bill precisely as the House had passed it, but there was some hope that they would take up something, at least related to DREAMers. Uh, Senator Durbin and Senator Graham, so Democrat and Republican, introduced a bill called the DREAM Act uh, in this Congress. Uh, it never actually had a hearing, so it just kind of sat there. And it was always pretty well understood, even from Senator Graham as a co-sponsor, that there was unlikely it was unlikely that, that bill was going to pass on its own, but perhaps paired with some sort of uh, border security legislation. We had hopes just you know, in the last two weeks that we might see some of that coming together, obviously with a lot of challenges at the U.S.-Mexico border right now. Senator Tillis from North Carolina and Senator Sinema from Arizona, so a Republican, and when they introduced to a Democrat, and she later became an independent within a few days of that announcement. Uh, but this tillis Cinema framework, uh, we never actually got to the point of seeing bill text, but the, our understanding was it would be a fairly generous version of the DREAM Act for more than 2 million individuals who came to the United States as children, so not just current DACA recipients, but a broader category, including those who came a little bit after 2007, um, probably up till 2018 was what I was hearing. Um, when they would have a chance to actually apply for green cards and citizenship, eventually it would be a long process. Uh, that would be paired with a lot of new money for border security, for border patrol, for asylum processing uh, for those arriving at the border, uh, as well as some new restrictions on who could qualify for asylum. Uh, some of those uh, border elements were things that the evangelical congregation table has called for in the past, like a, a additional adjudication of capacity for asylum. Some are things that I know at least at World Relief we would have concerns with, but we were at least encouraged to see bipartisan negotiations happening. Unfortunately, just, I mean, even since we scheduled this call, it became pretty clear late last week that they 
they don't seem to have the votes to pass that in the Senate, um, this Congress. I say that with the caveat that I'm a Christian who believes in miracles, and this is a time of year when we uh, we celebrate God having done some miracles in the incarnation. So I'm still committed to to prayer, and you know, some unlikely things have happened when there's the political will, but it it certainly doesn't look good at this point for this Congress. And the hard reality is it's going to be more difficult in the the new Congress, um, particularly in the House of Representatives. The Senate dynamics will change very little, but in the House, you have a different uh, House leadership. We're still not exactly sure who it will be, but we know it'll be on the Republican side. And at least um, the most likely speaker, uh, Kevin McCarthy, has said he has no interest in pairing dreamers with a border solution. So uh, he would do a border only bill that would almost certainly never pass the democratically controlled Senate. So there, we're, we're setting ourselves up for partisan stalemate um, in the new Congress. Um, now that might change if the Supreme Court rules and suddenly you're actually at this crisis point where a thousand people are losing their work authorization per day. Um, but I, I guess just to close, I would say a few things that we would love for you to do now. One thing would be if you have relationships with your U.S. senators um, and have the ability to reach them, you know, respectfully let them know, and this would be true on the Republican and the Democratic side, that this failure to find bipartisan consensus is really unacceptable. Uh, it's it's not, it's harmful to dreamers who are, um, in, in, I expect in many of your cases, members of your campus community, certainly, or alumni, uh, and individuals, most importantly, who are made in God's image, whom we are called to love, many of whom are brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, it'd be a great time to, you know, convey that message with op-eds as well. And again, I think there's accountability to be had on both sides of the aisle. The Democrats have almost all said they support a dreamer solution. Not all Republicans say that. Some do. Uh, but that this is coming up in the last you know, week and a half of Congress also speaks to it not necessarily being a priority for either party. Uh, I would also mention there's still some hope. Um, not a lot of hope around dreamers and border solutions, but there's a bill for Afghans and a bill for farm workers that is, are both bills that the evangelical immigration table has advocated on. There's still some hope one or both of those will be included in the omnibus spending bill that's being negotiated as we speak. Um, so it's separate from the dreamer issue, but that it particularly affects college campuses. But something if you have those relationships, it'd be great to highlight. Um, and then the last thing I would say is it's really an important time to be supporting the dreamer students on your campus. Um, this is, you know, I feel emotionally drained by the the back and forth of the last week, but I have, you know, very dear friends for whom this is like their lives that are on the line. And, you know, as they're doing finals this week or last week, they're also wondering if they're going to be allowed to stay in this country lawfully. And, um, you know, if they'll be able to use their excellent Christian college degree and actually get a job, or if the only jobs that they could possibly get will be the sort that, you know, don't usually require a bachelor's degree, that there's certain sectors of our economy that will hire people without work authorization unlawfully, but they don't tend to be the sort of jobs that require you to have a, a degree from an excellent Christian college or frankly pay a, a decent wage either so i would really encourage you to be doing all that you can to support dreamer students right now um, both in prayer and with any other support that you can provide and knowing the, the solidarity that, that their campus communities have with them and then to go into the new year and this is a, we need a solution as much as we ever have and perhaps more so going into the new year so advocating in any way that you have capacity and educating people on, you know, I think one of the challenges, frankly, congressionally is people don't feel that this is urgent because they haven't heard a lot about it in the news. Um, but we can fairly well predict where this is going with the Supreme Court case. And the best thing to do by far would be for Congress to resolve this before it gets to that Supreme Court decision. I'll stop there, Joel, and you can uh, pass it off to the next uh, panelist. Thanks, Matt. I um, You really created a very... Um hopeful scenario for us today. <laughs> but actually, the reason that I think this team of uh, valiant leaders needs to be together is so that we can um, look at our reality and realize that we are in a place of influence. And you've given us some good pieces that I, I really want to come back to by the end of our conversation to talk about what are some actionable steps that um, leaders from our schools can take to influence other leaders um, Jacob, is there anything that you'd like to add to what Matt said or share that the conversations that you're having with other leaders with the CCCU? Sure. Yeah. Just quickly. Thanks so much for those words, Matt. Um, we have long supported a permanent legislative solution, especially one that creates a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Um, extremely disappointed to hear about 
the cinema Attila's framework and where that currently stands. Um, we do have a little bit less optimism with the 118th Congress, uh, but we do have a Hill Day, February 1st, 2023, where we intend to activate our presidents, and this will be one of our main advocacy priorities. Um, so I'm here really just as an advocate and as a resource, and I really appreciate Matt's words about we are all Christians here. We believe in miracles, and we believe a God that is much greater than us is still in control. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Dr. Salguero, um, help us make the connection with what we've heard from Matt, as well as what you're seeing from especially our uh, Latino leaders and the connections and the impact on our communities where this is playing out. Well, thanks. Thanks, Joel. And thank you, Matt. And thank you, Jacob. I'm Gabriel Salguero. I'm the president and founder of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition, a coalition of 3,000 Hispanic evangelical congregations across the country. Um, and we're one of the members of the Evangelical Immigration Table and have worked a long time with Shirley Hoekstra and Joy and so many others at uh, Jacob, of course, at CCCU. And I actually serve on uh, three Christian higher education institution boards. One of them is represented here, Southeastern University, uh, also Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And so, um, should say that I have a degree from Eastern Nazarene College since you're in the room. Uh, I, I want to say this. I think that the news that you've heard from Matthew and Jacob and many of you executives at, at Christian higher uh, institutions have known uh, or know that it, that DACA has been under judicial peril for some time. And so we're not surprised by this. Many of us had hoped that that perhaps the Tillis Cinema framework would be acted on during the lame duck session. It does not appear to be the case. Uh, many of us were in Washington, D.C. about a month and a half ago, maybe, or a month, I, I lose time, but let's say a month, month and a half ago, uh, including some Christian higher ed representatives and the president of CCCU and others uh, meeting with our senators. I, I met with uh, Senator Rubio and um, office, uh, among other offices, and so there, and I, my advice to them was there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And so and we I think we had something like 20 pastors uh, from the Florida pastors, business persons, et cetera, law enforcement all behind this. Here's what I'm what I and also um, most recently, uh, President Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University, we worked together to have him do an op ed uh, in favor of, of DACA. And so that's been some of the work. Uh, that we've been trying to do. But at the heart of it, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor of a Latino congregation, and we our coalition represents Latino, Latina pastors. We are the fastest growing group of evangelicalism in America. We're also sending many of our sons and daughters uh, to Christian higher education because we want our students to have a Christian worldview at, at uh, what we find academically rigorous, but a Christian worldview uh, higher education systems. And so we've been working on this for over 10 years, for over 10 years. I was in Washington, D.C. when the the uh, the bill for the group of eight dropped and, and they were they didn't bring it to a vote in the House. And I was disappointed then. But, you know, we're as as uh, you've heard Zephaniah say, we're prisoners of hope. We don't yield on hope when we keep fighting. But there's a real sense of urgency um, around this because uh, for us, we talk about judicial peril, but this is really people's lives in peril, uh, economic futures, their families. And it is a time for, you know, whoever's in, in Christian higher ed to wrap their arms around DACA students and say, hey, look, we're with you. There has to be a kind of consistent messaging that you're walking the journey, you're co-sojourners with them, while at the same time advocacy. And so what I'm telling Christian higher ed leaders is that they have a dual role. One is the pastoral to walk alongside dreamers and their families. And the other is the prophetic to advocate, advocate, advocate for, for DACA. Um, and, and, and that people in the Hispanic churches are walking with you, but not just Latino evangelicals, Asian and African American and white evangelicals. You've all seen the Lifeway research that we're moving on this. The question becomes is, you know, how loud are our CCCU schools and how loud are our evangelical uh, institutions, denominations going to push this, especially in the next Congress? At the same time, to think really 
what happens if the Supreme Court sees this and there's a change? What alternative methods are we going to have so that these dreamers can access Christian higher education? I think sometimes we wait to the last minute to start crafting programs of responses. And I think that um, what I have seen is that partnerships with local churches is a, it's not the way forward, but is a way forward. Even as we fight the judicial kind of legislation, legislative battle, we need to start thinking of creative models to make sure dreamers are not left in, in, in this kind of educational limbo. And there are many churches and many leaders and many not-for-profits who want to work with Christian higher education on this regard. I think we're going to win the day eventually. I don't know when, but I'm in it for the long haul. Um, I've testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee why this is important to pastors. Because it's it's in interesting because Latino churches, and I'll close with this, are increasingly opening schools. And so in our coalition, we have many, many uh, faith-based charter schools. And we have what we call dual enrollment agreements with, with some Christian higher education, right? And some of our students are dreamers. And so now the question they ask us is, hey, pastors, I'm in dual, I'm dual enrolled, I'm getting associates credit, I'm, I'm part of this dual enrollment with X or Y school. What happens if, if the Supreme Court says, no, you don't qualify? What's next after I put in all these years and all this time? And so we who have these kind of Christian schools, um, and are partnering historically with Christian higher education are thinking of alternative ways, even as we advocate. But I don't think we need to lose track of where we are on this and definitely don't, to use a football metaphor, let's not uh, drop the ball on this. Let's stay on it. And I want to thank you. I know it's near uh, Christmas vacation and many of your folks have gone home. And thank you for investing in this because that means it's a priority for you. So that being said, I think... Um... I, uh, for those of you who are representing schools here, what are the questions that you have or observations um, at any point of what we've been mentioning here? And Gabe, I really appreciate your emphasis on uh, using the prophetic voice of, of the church, especially. But um, how do we, like, what are some of the questions that you might have or observations that you might have for the folks that are in this room today? And again, if you'll just identify what school you're with, if uh, that applies and we can move forward. Um, this is Lena um, at um, Southern Nazarene University. And um, I did tell Joel, you remember, I, I do have a hard stop at 1.30, um, but I really wanted to be in this Zoom room because this is very, very important. So I appreciate the prompt. Um, I guess I would just want to know is how can we band together, um, not only as CCCU schools, but also like what, what is the most, um, I mean, I know there's been a lot of important information and I want to thank you, Matthew and Gabriel, Pastor Gabriel for what you shared, but can you send us some talking points or some really clear things that we can root in with consistency in our voices. Um, number one for our um, talking about Southern Nazarene University, but we are we have a large number of sister schools. I know President Boone is also listening um, for Treveca, but <clears throat> what is that consistent message across our um, Southern Nazarene region that um, will speak to our you know churches? And then what does that mean for us as we as we think about what we are um, you know, doing for our DACA students? We have a few, um, but I know that we've had some um, challenges with this, especially when you reference what happened with the Trump administration. So it would be great if we had like that consistent on point message, um, not scripted, but really clear so that we are in unity and in harmony with what we're sharing. So that's one thing. And I know you don't need to say it verbally, but can someone send us that? And if it's been sent out, then forgive me because I don't I don't have that at my fingertips. So that would be the one, one thing that I would like to know. And then Jacob, it's good to see you here. We got to meet briefly at the office. I just wanna share with all of you that I am now serving in a dual role. Um, not only with my institution, but also as, the, as a senior fellow um, on issues of diversity and um, advisor 
to the um, president um, of the CCCU. So however I can collaborate or be helpful, please let me know. This is a new position. Um, it is it is not something that's fully formed out, but I'm very honored to serve here. So what can I do even in partnership with Jacob and other key leaders that can help with this? So I know that was a long soliloquy. I was trying to get it like thrown in there before 1.30, but those would be two items I just wanted to make sure I said. And I know that I don't expect a response back um, because I'm, I'm going to bow out. But Joel, to you, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll pass this information on to our president, Dr. Keith Newman. I know that um, he would want to know what happened today. He also probably doesn't know that I got the opportunity to jump in here. So thank you so much. And to all of the leaders and the voices here in this space, just very, very grateful. Um, Lena, you thank you for and I might be le reaching out to some of you for our big diversity conference in October of 2023, because I think this will have to be a leading um, a leading theme yeah. as we launch our um, next diversity conference for the CCCU. So I'll Lena, leave thank it there. you for stepping in. I know you got to step out here shortly. And um, I do want to just mention that Dr. Boone also needs to step away shortly. Uh, Dr. Boone, I don't know if you have it, just a second to share. One of the, the questions that comes up is specifically with universities is the balancing act that you often have to carry in not only advocating for your students, but also knowing that issues relating to the sensitive immigration topics can be a touchy thing. Like how, how do you carry this message to your constituents? And Dr. Boone, do you have something you'd like to share on that level? Um, yeah, I think I think we drop constantly into into our theology of a of a church that is global, and our concern for human beings that rises above where citizenship lines happen to be drawn. Um, I I always have to start there: the dignity of the very people that we're talking about, the fact that they are our brothers and sisters, made in the image of God. I, you know, I I think you start with what is core theology of of humankind. Uh, you know, the, the next level for me is always that in our particular denomination, people sacrifice, uh, give offerings. Uh, we, you know, we the Nazarenes punch far beyond our weight in terms of a global missions presence. And that this has been core to our story for uh, for our history. And, you know, why would we uh, why would we sacrifice to the level that we do? Uh, to make sure to have global presence. And yet, when that global presence comes to our doorstep, we treat it very differently than we would otherwise. That that logic seems to get through a lot of people who whose uh, opinions about DACA and immigration come primarily from conservative news talk shows. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I go in those places. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in a state that, um, uh, you know, senators and uh House of Representatives, um, uh, you know, our, our leadership has just been intransigent on this issue, even though I've worked, worked with them and talked with them and they are my friends. And we're losing Jim Cooper, who has been one of the great boosters uh, for us. And he, he's stepping aside and uh, the people who've been elected in his, you know, new, newly redistrict uh, area are, are not going to support this. So, uh, you know, I'm even trying to function in a state that doesn't have uh, equal tuition uh, for DACA students. They have to pay out-of-state tuition to actually go to a public school in Tennessee, which makes it literally impossible for them uh, uh, to, to meet that hurdle. So it's just basically keep, you know, I have to beat the bushes to find as much money as I can to lay alongside our aid to be able to have our DACA students here. And, um, and I, you know, I try to tell the story. They are the most appreciative, hardest working, uh, uh, non-privileged people that we have on our campus every day. And their presence humbles the rest of us. Uh, none of us work as hard as they do. Uh, and I, and I see that up, uh, up front, up, up close, uh, you know, every day. So we continue to work on this. I, you know, as Jacob was mention, mentioning, I know CCCU has this as one of our three top priorities at this point. And we, uh, uh, we were really hoping for some lame duck uh, 
uh, movement on it. So I, I'm saddened today uh, to hear what I'm hearing, uh, but I think we have to keep uh, we have to keep telling the story. The reality is, uh, on the at the CCCU level, uh, I think a part of what is driving a lot of us in terms of moving our institutions is that the very people that we serve actually are core electors of government officials who oppose the very um, DACA resolution <laughs> that uh, that the people who are voting for them and they send their uh, kids to our colleges actually support. So it's a it's an odd place for us to be in where our own constituents in many ways are a part of the problem uh, of us being able to resolve the DACA issue. So I think we have to uh, uh, you know, be be as brave as we're able to be. And uh, for me, it, it's become not so much a political issue as an educational issue. And educational institutions, we say we know how to educate, so we ought to do it. We ought to just get out there and uh, in every way that we can, speaking, writing, uh, post, blog, social media, whatever we can do, uh, we ought to try to tell this story as carefully as we can. And, and if we can get the ground moving underneath the political machine, it may be a little bit easier for the political machine to, uh, you know, to, to I, I don't think it's going to get done at face value. I think it's probably going to get done as a bargaining chip for something else. Uh, and I'll take it however we can get it. Dan, can I just ask you that you can refuse to answer if you want to, but like, what do you say to your colleagues who kind of shy back? Because not everyone has the boldness to speak, use their prophetic voice. And I would say their prophetic responsibility. How do you encourage folks who are maybe hesitant or um, this is fresh water for them to step into? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly don't shame them at that point. And each one of them knows the political capital that they have to have to operate their university with their board of trustees. Uh, but there was a time uh, 40, 40 years ago, maybe, that college presidents and, were leaders of communities and leaders of thought in our nation. And now, uh, very sadly, my own profession of college presidents, we've just basically become safe political figures out there uh, trying to make sure we can still raise money. So it's a, you know, it's a sad thing that 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 um, that that fear has risen to that level. Uh, the other thing I think I would say is I, I feel for a lot of our presidents who aren't blessed with with a with a theological framework with the with the capacity to attach this issue to their theological narrative. Uh, so you know my whole my whole hope is to help as many of our presidents as I can to to find their voice within their own theology uh, and then. And then move in tandem with that. So if you don't start this issue inside your own story, you're going to have a hard time bringing your people along. I really appreciate that. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. I want to keep this as brief as possible. And I think what I've heard from uh, both what Dr. Crusoe said and Gabe in some of your comments is that we do need to engage follow-up conversations and really use this network and a growing network that the CCU CU has uh at its fingertips to equip and um, and empower and inspire other leaders. Uh, are there other questions that any of you might have before we wrap up our time together? Just a quick follow-up. Are, are there any research on the impact, economic impact, should DACA be repealed on Christian higher education and schools? Um, in addition to the, obviously the moral narrative, is there something out there that, that people can hold on to and present to their colleagues? To my knowledge, no, I don't have those figures now. That's something that we be working with Dr. Crusoe to figure out. Yeah, I'm not aware of it either, but it, I think there are kind of generally for higher education, some numbers, but Christian college specific, I'm, I've not seen, but I think it, I mean, the basic input, you know, I know the Christian colleges that I'm closest to are struggling with enrollment, which I think is a pretty common story. And if, that's that doesn't get easier when you have fewer students who could be you know it's very hard it's hard for doc students already because they don't get federal financial aid but if they don't have the likelihood of being able to accept employment upon graduation it's also a lot harder for them to take a student loan to go to uh, college 
I would also okay. just say, um, you know, Dr. Boone didn't mention this quite specifically, but Trevecca is a really incredible model for other Christian colleges in how they have very creatively found ways to bring Dreamer students onto their campus. I don't know if this is, I can't verify this. I don't know how to get the data, but I would bet that a higher share of students are, are DACA recipients at Trevecca Nazarene University than of any college in the country. I mean, it's not the same overall number as like a UCLA or, you know, University of Florida, but in terms of like the share of their students, it's really remarkable. And that's really a credit to some creative leadership and fundraising and, you know, finding ways to make the finances work that I'd encourage other Christian colleges to look at. And the last thing I would say as an encouragement, I, I think it's very understandable to feel like, you know, our constituencies aren't with us on this. It is absolutely true that evangelical Christians need some education and need, frankly, some Bible study on this topic. It's also true, though, that four out of five evangelicals in the, the most recent LifeWay research study on this say they support Congress acting on a solution for DREAMers, especially if it is paired with some other dynamics, including improvements to border security, which is, you know, is probably the, the package that is likely to come together. So it's it's not as edgy as it might seem to go out and say we should be leading on a solution for DREAMers that can include some other elements as well. Yeah, well said, Matt. Hey, and Gabe, I think I did see in the CCCU Immigration Resources, there's a, a website. Jacob probably knows the exact name of the website. I, I think I did see some economic impact. I know I've read a good article on the economic impact within the last six months. I just don't remember where I saw it. That's just probably higher education in general, right? Not not. No, I think I think the I think what I saw was basically impacting the workplace. It could have even been a study done here in the Nashville area. Uh, oh, forgive my brain. I read too much stuff and can't remember where it all <laughs> well, came from. Listen, if, if we all had the brain you had, I think the world would be a much better place. So please, <laughs> you're too you're too humble, Dan. We appreciate you. And hey, congrats on your uh, award uh, in November in D.C. Well deserved to Trebecca. Thanks, friend. I will um, also say that the I appreciate Dr. Uh, Jaron Rowell from President of Nazarene Theological Seminary. Um, after his visit to DC for leading the way, uh, convening with the National Immigration Forum and the EIT, uh, he's teaching a, a course. I think uh, Dr. Durkin helped me. It's pastoral theology this next semester. And he is inviting a number of uh, practitioners, clergy, to speak into that class specifically on the role of using your prophetic voice. Um, and I'll be sharing with one of those sessions specifically on our work with immigration. And I love the, the pathways that the universities are seeing um, besides special conferences, but how to incorporate this language into the coursework, especially for those who are going into ministry, um, people of influence. I think that there's an avenue in any major that uh, a university would have to offer though, that we could um, step into those conversations and see the impact of dreamers and more broadly immigration as a whole. Yeah. Can I just add, look, I mean, the, some of this stuff that's being said here, if the CCCU or EIT could package as best practices and send to the president's council and things like this, I think we all learn from people who are doing it well and we don't wait. So for example, I, I'm on the board of SEU. We just started a grant program. We're working with Hispanic students to become HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutions, those kind of things. If if we're able to somehow compile that, I think people build on success and sometimes they don't know good entry points. So you highlight Dan's work or highlight SEU work or highlight ENCs or NTS or you know whoever, uh, you know, and a broad swath so every denomination feels represented. If CCCU could do that, I think it would, it could help us move the needle a little more. Just a suggestion, if it already hasn't done it, and if it has, I'd love that to see that so we could share it also among the Latino churches. Well, before we wrap up, I would um, like for us to just have a, a moment of prayer for not only our uh, this meeting, but also the dreamers that we all know and that are being educated and prepared and those who are already serving in throughout the country. And Dr. Boone, if, do you have the space to be able to close our time together in prayer today? Sure. Awesome. Kind and gracious God, in the season of your coming, uh, we recognize that those who, there are those among us who are so open to see that happen. 
uh, on a national platform in a welcoming way. We pray for our dreamers today. Uh, we know them by name. There are there are neighbors. There are friends. Uh, we think of the work that our dreamer graduates are already doing in our world, and we think of those uh, who still have stars in their eyes, even as their parents have tears uh, tears in their eyes regarding the hope and possibility of a college education. So we we think of these. But beyond this, Lord, we think of the family systems that are impacted by this. We think of neighborhoods and communities. Uh, we think of a job market tightening. We think of the um, uh, of the potential that we're going to raise another embittered generation uh, by simply refusing to grant them access. Uh, I pray that you would help each of us to know exactly where our space is that we can have influence and imprint. Uh, we pray that you would work miraculously uh, within Congress. Uh, we've seen that even in the past weeks with religious protection uh, language written into a bill. Uh, we, we've seen things happen that we really didn't know could happen. Uh, so we are those who don't <laughs> underestimate who you are. Uh, because the reality is our, our God is not too small for this. And we confess that you are the grand lover of all humankind. And we pray that you would help us to be found in the middle of your work, uh, neck deep, thinking as carefully as we can, acting as wisely as we can, and demonstrating to all um, the likeness to Jesus Christ in the process. We offer this prayer humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Last chance. And anybody else have anything they'd like to say? And Todd, you uh, appeared here. I'm not sure. I'm not. I, Todd's a, my friend, and he's awesome. from Belmont University. Dr. Todd so Lake, he's good. the vice president there. So we got Tennessee well represented here today, and, uh, and he was able he to join at the minute. I, I, I was not up to speed on my tech, so I, I saw Gabe's text way too late. But you know, I can sum everything up by saying that the awful news is <clears throat> Gabe is our first Latino board member. And the great news is Gabe is our first Latino board member. So <laughs> that sums up a lot of our worlds, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we're awesome. getting there. We're getting there. Hey, Joel, thanks for all your hard work, my dear brother, and and Matt and Jacob and all of you. You know, we do wish you the very merriest of Christmases, that the, the Christ who was born in Bethlehem have room uh, also in our in our nation. We love you. We love all of you. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here today. And we will follow up with some good, helpful points on our next steps here. Thank you. See you all. later. Bye-bye, everyone. Here. Bye.